It was 1981. Sitting alone at our dated four brown formica kitchen table in one of six black vinyl chairs, I nervously swiveled back and forth. My dad, Stan, and my stepmom, Denise, had called my mom that morning and asked to come over to talk about something important related to me. That was unusual. The three of them huddled in the adjacent family room, speaking in hushed tones while I waited. The compressor on our aging refrigerator constantly whirred, and the distinctive ticking of a massive wall clock in our entryway became more amplified as I strained to hear the conversation. My mind raced trying to think what I had done, if anything wrong. I settled on one thing. They figured out I'd found my stepdad's X-rated videos, and I was busted. Shit! I thought I'd covered my tracks, but it's hard to keep your head clear as a 15-year-old who's fallen in a trance watching Seika, the platinum princess of porn. <laughs> Maybe I didn't rewind the video. Crap, did I leave it in the Betamax? Oh, fuck. <laughs> my parents entered with surprisingly somber faces. Dad and Denise sat directly across from me and my mom to my left. Seeing my likeness in the three full-length mirrors behind them with the three of them facing me felt like an interrogation. I don't quite remember who spoke first, only that my mom never talked. Whatever had been discussed, I sensed it was a surprise to her as well. Avoiding eye contact, I focused on the harvest gold floral wallpaper, the texture popping off the wall. My dad spoke. I wanted to ask you some questions about Mr. Wheeler the fellow I used to work with, he's in trouble. A jolt of adrenaline pulsed through my body. This had nothing to do with the contraband porn. It was far worse. <laughs> Dad was dredging up events from two years prior, the summer of 1979. That year, on a crisp spring night, Dad and I met Wheeler and his son, John, at a Parkway Plaza carnival. I had recently turned 13 and John was 12. Apparently, our dads had talked at work about the challenges of single parenting. Driving to the mall, dad explained, Wheeler has John full time and wants him to meet some nice, smart friends like you who can be a positive influence. We met up at the ticket booth. John had a blonde, all-American look. Dad and Wheeler were both middle-aged, but unlike dad, he was trying too hard to pull off suave when he had no swagger. Gawky, with thinning, grease-back, salt-and-pepper hair, heavy stubble accentuated his five o'clock shadow. He paired a white polo shirt with a pocket protector. <laughs> John and I wandered and connected by concluding the carnival was lame and the carnies creepy. An hour in, we were ready to go, so Wheeler offered to buy us funnel cakes. My face lit up. This was a treat. My folks generally didn't have the money to splurge on fair food and Wheeler knew it. While we devoured the fried delights, he commented on some cute teen girls, hinting that we might like to ask them out. He pried, you're a handsome fella. I bet you have lots of girls chasing you. I shook my head. Two months after the carnival, Wheeler asked my dad if my 15-year-old brother and I would be interested in babysitting John at their Ocean Beach cottage, getting paid to be beach bums five days a week. In early June, we met at their house to get a lay of the land. Wheeler asked personal questions about school and hobbies, wanting to get to know us and make sure we wanted the job. He insisted we go to Big Olaf's for ice cream. As we loaded into his massive Cadillac, I asked about the <laughs> Jesus Fish Praise and Praise the Lord bumper stickers. Wheeler laughed. When the cops see those, they let me off with just a warning. <laughs> Ah, shucks, officer. I regret that I've displeased the Lord with transgression of speeding. His eyes sharpened. Those suckers fall for it every time. <laughs> At the kitchen table, my dad continued. Wheeler's been arrested. I dug my fair bare feet into the orange shag carpet, bracing for what might be coming. I focused on my dad's balding head as he continued, his voice trembling. They raided his house in OB and found some disturbing things. I didn't want to talk about that fucking creep. I had, my, I had tried my best to erase Wheeler from my mind. Did they know? Were they going to question why I didn't speak up two summers ago? 
Denise cut Dowd off in mean, her thick southern drawl, stated, I'll never understand why you let our boys spend the summer at that shithole he called a home. I glanced towards my mom before Denise's words trailed off and caught a subtle eye roll. She despised when Denise appropriated the motherly role in our lives. Dingy was the best way to describe the cottage on Long Branch. The gig was daytime only, but a few weeks in, Wheeler convinced us to sleep over. The first time was to participate in a grunion run, which sounded kind of cool. <laughs> he he we headed out at 11 p.m. and returned at 2 with no fish to show, but Wheeler stood smiling at the door when we got back, which seemed odd. He had to leave for work at 7 a.m. As the summer progressed, his invites were more frequent, often without reason, Wheeler always let us watch late night TV, including R-rated movies on HBO. He treated us to fast food frequently and his favorite haunt was Jack Off in the Box. <laughs> Dad's voice sobered. The police want to question anyone who might have seen anything. At this point, my body temperature began to rise. Amazingly, I didn't sweat. One night in mid-August, my brother didn't stay over. John and I were wiped out from boogie boarding big waves all day. John went to bed and I was brushing my teeth. Wheeler pushed his head in the bathroom, asking if there were any cute girls on the beach who caught my interest. This was a recurring topic, so I didn't think much of it. He mentioned that he had some good advice and asked me to chat with him in another room so he wouldn't wake John. It felt weird but I agreed. He brought up girls again and wanted to know if I had sexual thoughts about them. This felt extremely uncomfortable, but I answered, yes. He moved next to me and asked if I ever jacked off thinking about girls on the beach. I don't know why I didn't run out of the room or out of the house. Would my dad have let us work for a creep? Was he only saying these creepy things to me? Wheeler then told me to t pull down my shorts because he wanted to show me what it felt like to come. In one quick motion, he tugged them to the ground and knelt between my legs. Petrified and paralyzed, I couldn't make an audible sound as the stubble savagely tore my thighs. My parents' words drew me back to the dining room, those gut-wrenching memories having raced through my mind in seconds. Mom looked visibly shaken as the thought of that something terrible had happened, her empathetic brown eyes tearing up. I directed my attention to my stepmom as she carried the conversation. Her thin plucked eyebrows transformed her face from angry to sinister. Fire filled her eyes. Denise spoke, her voice laced with hate. Wheeler apparently assaulted several boys for many years. They are pictures. I sat up rigidly, the vinyl piping pressing into my spine. The swiveling ceased. My mind raced again. Did he take pictures of me? I quickly calmed my fears. His assault had taken place in complete darkness. I would have seen a flash bulb. Over the past two years, when my mind reluctantly returned to that moment, I felt oddly relieved for the darkness. The ensuing nightmares would have been way worse had images of the attack been etched in my brain. Dad leaned across the table. The police are building as big a case as they can, and we worry that you might be a victim because you spent the entire summer at his house. Suddenly, the aftermath of the assault rushed back. The day after, pacing, pacing, pacing the entirety of Ocean Beach, from Dog Beach to the pier, and back and forth for hours. Why did this happen to me? He's a man. I'm a boy. Did I lead him on? Was this my fault? I ultimately decided to say nothing. I, was, I convinced myself that I shouldn't have frozen. I should have fought back. The ticking clock drew me back to the room. I don't know when I put my hands in my lap, but they were balled in fists with my fingers digging into my flesh. The fog of panic set in. Would it make a difference if I confessed the assault or if I admitted that I'd covered it up? Would my parents punish me for hiding such massive lies? Then my dad asked the big question. 
did he try to do anything sexual to you? Before I could answer, Denise piped in. Stan, if that beast harmed our son, I'm going to make sure that you rot in hell with Satan himself. My decision was clear. Lie. <laughs> Nothing like that happened, I, li I led. I quit OB because Wheeler's questions about girls seemed kind of creepy. Realizing this was too revealing, I veered. We had just moved. I wanted a week to set up my new room before starting a new school. I prioritized shielding my dad from the wrath of my stepmom. At 15, I saw no upside to the truth. Wheeler was going to prison based on documented evidence, and if I answered honestly, I'd be admitting I was weak and gullible, someone who needed a babysitter. My parents would likely stop me from getting my driver's license. I've often questioned how much my life trajectory would have differed had I not lied or downplayed what actually happened. Over the years, internalizing my shame about the assault and its aftermath became a cancer to my confidence and a crutch to which I capitulated when it was easier to be the victim. I convinced myself I lacked the power to push through adversity. When engineering coursework felt too difficult in my first two years at MIT, and when I soured on the idea of finishing my economics PhD at Michigan, I refused to work through the negative feelings about why I was failing. I convinced myself it was okay because my confidence and resolve had been robbed at 13. Over time, I turned to writing as a way to process difficult moments and work through relationships. But every time I tried to capture my feelings about the attack, I ended up staring at a blank journal. My chest tightened and my brain fogged. For 44 years, I pondered pointless permutations of what ifs until 2023 when I mapped an escape path to inner peace. I finally formed the words that I wish I had spoken, seated across from my parents at the Four Mica table. Stepping to the mic at the San Diego Poetry Slam, I exercised Orr Wheeler's stranglehold on my psyche, conjuring the strength to process emotions and feelings that had been bottled inside me for decades. It's time to stop giving that evil creep power. I'm gonna roar, not hold back and cower. Your roar makes you wonder, what does that mean? I confess, I was raped at the age of 13. In front of this crowd, I shouted out loud, still standing proud, my dark secret avowed. It wasn't my choice because predators prey. I'll no longer keep quiet till all predators pay. Thank you. Alicia Richard.